This episode of the Blackstick Global Podcast is sponsored by Blackstick Global Passport. Join aspiring Black expats, expats, and repats, where you can build community, get resources, and gain support along your journey abroad. You're invited to join Blackstick Global Passport. Inside Passport, you'll find exclusive workshops on everything from expat taxes, financial planning, insurance, job boards, accountability check-ins, and more. More. You can even take Passport on the go with our app available for iOS and Android devices. Just click the link in the episode you're listening to or visit blacksitglobal.com and click on Passport. See you inside. There's a country or there's a place that will call to you. You'll know it. You'll feel it. Close your eyes and imagine living a life you love, unapologetic and unbothered free from daily microaggressions from Karens and Kens, free from the fear of police brutality and systemic racism. Wouldn't that feel amazing? Now open your eyes. What if I told you that it's possible? Hear inspiring stories and get the actual blueprints from brothers and sisters of the diaspora who are living out their wildest dreams abroad. You've heard the term, now be inspired by the movement. I'm Krishan Wright, and this is Blacksit Global. I have been waiting, I can't believe, now three seasons <laughs> for this conversation on the Blacksit Global podcast. I have the opportunity to chat with the lovely Thea Duncan. She is the founder of Doing Italy, an online training company that helps people gain the knowledge that they need to move to Italy with ease. She is joining us today from Milan. Welcome to Black Sick Global, Thea. Yay! <laughs> I am so happy that you're here. I want to get right on into it because there is so much I want to ask you. So you are Trinidad and Tobago born and Miami raised, mm. but Italy captured your heart and that's where you call home. So Tell me about your upbringing. Were you always a globetrotter? I want to say pretty much. You know, born in Trinidad and Tobago, um, my parents and I moved to the United States when I was about six years old. So I never had the issue. You know, some people get their passports later on in life. We had to get our passports to move to the States. And I think my mom probably wanted to travel a lot herself and for all the reasons that is life. And I mean, my mom grew up, she was one of 12 kids in the country in Trinidad and Tobago, right? So travel was definitely not something that was really in the cards for her and her family. Um, but they definitely instilled that want, that drive into us. When we moved to Miami, especially because Miami is so international and has such a huge Latin American um, influence, my parents, I won't say forced, but very strongly encouraged, <laughs> you know, the, the Caribbean parents, right, us to study Spanish. And so they enrolled us in a bilingual program, and I was actually studying Spanish and we had math, Spanish, and like humanities in Spanish for three hours every single day for like the next 12 years. And I was actually one of those people that was blessed. We went to Spain, I want to say in the fifth grade is when I got to travel there with like, you know, the school program. So it was definitely always something that I knew existed. And my parents were never the ones that were like, no, you can't go abroad or no, you can't do that. Not that it was like move abroad, but if the world in a sense was always kind of like our oyster, if, if that makes sense. Yes. Oh my gosh. And there's so many similarities. My mom is one of 12 as well. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Big family. But so let me ask you this before I ask you my next question. So how many passports do you have then? 
No, I just have two. Oh, I have okay. like the Trinidadian passport and the American passport. Oh, um, wow. Contemplating if I want to get the Italian one right now, I definitely qualify. I just haven't done it yet. So. Oh, okay. Wow. Options. I love it. I love it. Like you said, mm-hmm. the world is truly your oyster. Mm-hmm. So you chose to study in Italy for your master's. Tell me about that decision. Had you traveled to Italy before then, or what was it that really spoke to your heart? Well, like I said, always had a very international upbringing because I went to a bilingual school. My goal, my plan had always been to study abroad in Spain. And um, I did a semester in Spain, loved it, Santiago de Compostela. And then I did a semester in Italy and I loved it as well. The thing is, is I tell people, my students in in my master class, I tell them that there's a country or there's a place that will call to you. You'll know it, you'll feel it, right? And maybe it'll just call to you for a brief period of time, for a long period of time. But considering that there's so many different places you can go in the world, like, and I don't think there's any right or wrong decisions. There's a right or wrong decision for you. I went to Italy. I went to this little itsy bitsy town about an hour outside of Rome called L'Aquila. And I knew it was like my place. You know, I could walk up and down the Corso, what the Italians call the main pedestrian street. About two, three times a week, they had the market. Back then, this was in 2003. Um, Italy had almost like no Black people, especially from, let's see, in a little town like the one I was in. So everybody knew who I was. You know, like people would stop me on the road and they'd be like, oh, you're the Black girl from Miami? And of course, I'd never met them before in my life. But they were also very, very welcoming. It wasn't an inquisitive where... At least I personally, I didn't feel like in harm. I didn't feel they were invasive. I felt very welcomed. And I was like, I love this country and I need to figure out a way to come back. And so I went back to the States, finished my undergrad, and I eventually got a scholarship from Rotary International that allowed me to return to Italy. They, you know, kind of pick where they're going to send you. And um, I enrolled in Bocconi, which is the university I attended for my master's program. And that's how I ended up back in Italy and back in Milan. Yes, yes, which is a nice little segue into our conversation on Milan. So (laughs) when I think about Milan, I think about high fashion houses and luxury brands like Gucci and Armani. But I would imagine that there's much more to Milan than that. So tell me a little bit why you call Milan home. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. (laughs) I don't even know sometimes. Um, Well, I obviously got here for school and Milan was everything that you just said. Milan is fashion. It's, you know, they say Italians are fashionable and then Milan, it just ups it like 10 times. So I remember when I first got to Milan, Rotary required that I do like a few weeks, I think it may have been like a month of intensive Italian school in Florence. And so I already spoke Italian at this point in time, but definitely I took more schooling and my Italian improved dramatically because of it. And my friend and I were supposed to go from Florence up to Milan to do a day trip and kind of like scope it out while I was still you know, studying Italian in in Florence. And she overslept, missed her train. And I was like, well, I already have my ticket. I might as well just go, right? And I got to Milan in the middle of August, which if anybody knows Italy in August, especially almost 20 years ago, there was nobody here. Like the university literally had like a roller. um, What do you call those things? Like I'm not going to call it barb, but the doors to the university were shut. You know, like it was like closed. Oh my gosh. (laughs) But 
there were no stores. Back then, they only had two supermarkets open in like the whole city. So I'm like, what am I going to do? What's going on? Anyways, this is a really roundabout way to get to your story, (laughs) your question. (laughs) And I am like sitting at what the Italians call a bar, which is actually like a cafe. And I'm talking to these guys. And again, it's, this was in 2005, still like black women were still just not a thing here. And I guess people, I've won beauty pageants, another sidetrack in my life, right? So let's say you can consider me an attractive Black woman, right? And Italians are always very appreciative, right? (laughs) And so, like, I'm at this cafe. They were like, Thea, you can stay at this friend's house and we're going to a house party and blah, 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 blah. All this kind of craziness that my father would die if he knew that I did, right? And they ended up showing me around. But I remember, and this is how I get back to your question, everybody's wearing like a Rolex watch and they're like dressed to the nines and like, you know, like linen and like Todd, like driving shoes <laughs> You know, and even like, I think there should be a Instagram feed about Italians on bikes, especially in Milan, because you'll see women in like perfectly pressed high heels. I mean, pressed pants, high heels, perfect makeup on a bicycle. And you're like, how do you do that? I still don't understand all these years later. I definitely have an appreciation of that kind of level of attention and the aesthetic let's say I I, not let's say I like the finer things in life and I like people to be fancy and even if I'm not dressed fancy I like to look at people dressed fancy (laughs) which is probably why I love Milan long way to answer that question But besides that, Milan also definitely gives you the most international of approach to Italy. So it is Italy that looks to the rest of the world. So it has all of the major financial institutions here. Um, The Italian stock market is housed here. All of the major fashion companies have their like global headquarters in Milan. So while some of them may produce someplace else, it's Milan where the like like the money moves are happening, which means Milan turns out to be a great place to work. And it has like an international influx of all the people who are either coming when it's like fashion week or if they're coming when it's design week, um, which is also very big here. Or also if, you know, like they're thinking about buying or investing in Italy. It's just kind of where the stuff happens. And I liked it. I stayed. <laughs> no, that is great. So <laughs> <laughs> no, that is, that paints the perfect picture. So mm-hmm. you talked a little bit about being a black woman in Italy at a time where there weren't as many as there are now. So are Italians surprised when they hear you speak their language? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, from then to now, there's been a huge influx of people from other parts of the world. Um, When I first got here, I would tell people, oh, I'm American. And they'd look at me and they'd go, but where are you really from? (laughs) You know, and I'm obviously not born in the United States, but no one in the U.S. ever asked me, where are you from, Thea? Where are you really from? I realized it was because Italians associated Americans with being blonde and blue-eyed, right? But all of that changed when President Obama became elected. And all of a sudden, there was this incredible family that were incredibly well-educated and representing the United States in a way that a lot of Italians didn't know about. And I swear, no one ever asked me that question again. It was like the last time, like they got elected and that never happened anymore. That said, you know, 
there's so many more foreigners in Italy now. There's so many more black people. There's so many more black women because the first people that arrived were black male. And, you know, like the black women kind of trickled in afterwards. Um, I think what surprises them is that my Italian is so good. Not so much that I speak it because my master's program was taught in Italian. My husband says that I have a very cultured Italian because like I, I have a master's degree here. It taught in the language. Obviously, I still make mistakes. Sometimes he says it's what keeps it endearing. But yeah, I do get Italians commenting on the fact that my Italian is so good. Wow. Even though I still have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I've caught snippets of you speaking Italian, and I think that it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. So you met your husband and mm-hmm. fell in love, and you guys had your son in Italy. So I'm interested in hearing about that part of the story, the birth experience, like having a baby in Italy, because Mm -hmm. what I've heard from different people is that with the Italian culture, especially as you compare it to the United States, there are marked differences. And while I know you can't really compare (laughs) birth experiences because you have one child, I'm just curious, just if there's anything that you can share about how your that choice to have your son in Italy and then also raising him and how that is so different from your own upbringing. So many questions, so many questions. We'll just, I'll try and you see how I like go completely off topic sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) No, you know what? I threw a lot. So wherever we go, we go. (laughs) I will talk about, well, you know, I got married, we decided to have a child. And I think as a mom, as parents, you're always thinking about what's the world going to be like for this little human being that I'm bringing into the world. And, you know, we haven't talked about it much thus far, but racism does exist in Italy. It exists everywhere in the world to various degrees. And so there was a level of concern in my mind as to how are these people going to treat my child? Because obviously it is absolutely unacceptable that you treat my child in anywhere other than fabulous because he is fabulous. (laughs) But Italy is home. We decided, you know, we had talked about me giving birth in the United States or not. That basically came down to a money topic, right? Um, Italy has public health care. I think my husband and I decided to do a dual private and public in the sense that we had a private doctor that paid about 150 euros a month per visit, which is still nothing compared to the US, right? And she would just be like my one doctor that followed me from the beginning to the end. And then Everything else we did in terms of, you know, like the prenatal exams and the ultrasounds and all those kind of blood tests we did at the hospital where I had decided that I wanted to give birth because that's how it works here. You decide you're going to give birth at a hospital and that's the hospital does everything for you. I can say that besides the private doctor And I decided to do like a DNA test because I was over 35, you know, like from A to Z, the whole thing was like maybe $200. Like what? Oh my gosh. Unreal. Unreal. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, and it wouldn't have even have costed the 200 euros to $200 if it wasn't for, you know, like an extra test that maybe they said they wanted to do that the Italian government didn't cover for some reason or another. But basically giving birth in Italy is essentially free. And one of the interesting things that I think about now, like just yesterday, my girlfriend and I, I have another American girlfriend that lives near here. And um, we went to the park, you know, we did the very Italian, let's have coffee and sit and chat, you know? And she's like, Thea, 
I just found out because she was working in a clinic and she had her child and she quit. And she's like, do you know that I qualified for unemployment because the government says that if you quit your job in the first year of your child's birth, it was like being forced to quit your job because you couldn't accommodate working and raising a child. So they give you unemployment for the whole year. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like you are blowing my mind. I wasn't sure when I asked the question where the story would fully go, but you are blowing my mind right yeah. now. <laughs> in fact, when she told me that, I was like, oh my gosh. And I think that goes to speak to the fact that in the U.S., they say we are pro-life, we are pro-families, we are like a family-founded, you know, like we believe in family, but they don't put in the policies and the procedures to back that up. Like maternity leave is a thing here. And as a woman who's had a child and for the first three months, I could barely think. <laughs> and then I'm like, so many women have no maternity leave in the United States. And two weeks after they're born, they're back at work. It is absolutely absurd to me. And I say, uh, you see, I get all, you heard the, the, the tone rise. I'm like, if we really care about women, if we really care about our families, then you put systems, you put processes, you put safeguards in place to allow mothers to be mothers, right? And for us to be there for our kids, especially in that first year of life, that we know it's fundamental without making it like that you have to lose your job or you have to choose between, you know, between things that are just really hard, you know? So... <laughs> That was decision number one, and I guess almost two. I remember in the midst of it, another one of my American girlfriends here, she was like, she was maybe three months further ahead than I was. And she was like, Thea, you can't have your baby in the United States. And she's a little white girl. She's like, they kill black women. They kill pregnant black women. She was like, do you know what the rate of maternal, like, Death is in the United States. And that was part of the decision process to have my child here too. Besides the fact that the U.S. has like a maternal death rate, so it's like one of the highest in the developed world, even though like Italy still has their race relation issues and all that kind of stuff, like their maternal death rates are like almost non-existent, Right. So that was another level of the decision-making process of deciding to have my son like physically give birth in Italy. Um, the way the Italians are as doctors and the healthcare system is completely different. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, I could just keep on going on and on and on and on and on about this. I mean, I give birth, you have to stay a minimum of three days. I would go into the nursing's ward and I think I did a good job of choosing the hospital where I gave birth to, but like the nurse was there, like helping me breastfeed, you know, like I remember like I was like manually expressing, I don't remember why. And then like, of course, like you're getting like, like not even a centimeter out of milk when you're first doing it. And she was like, yeah, Thea, you're doing a great job, you know, like. I felt so encouraged in the whole process. I have a lot of American girlfriends. Another girlfriend, I was like, what am I going to do about breastfeeding? Do I need to get a cover up? Do I need to get one of these little shirts that I see? And she's like, Thea, whip out your breast and breastfeed your child. <laughs> Hello. I mean, you've nailed so much of why I wanted to ask that question between, you know, the comparisons and then and hitting on the disgusting <laughs> disparity in maternal, Black maternal death rate, mm -hmm. and just the American culture as it relates to women caring for their children and breastfeeding, you know, mm -hmm. and just feeling like you have to go in a bathroom or cover up and it's just, let's see, it defies logic, really, because it's hard for me to even put it into words as someone who 
breastfed both of my children. I best breastfed both of my children for two years each. Mm -hmm. Like I was committed to that, but I can't say that it was always, especially in public, a very good experience for Mm -hmm. the reasons that you articulated. So thank you for that. So what is, what is life like for him as he is now a toddler and exploring Um, this world? Oh my gosh. And so I should have known it would have been fine because there's a supermarket near me and, you know, I do groceries like every single day, every other day, because it's the way Italians do groceries. And the lady at the supermarket would be like, see ya. Even if, because there's a line for elderly and the pregnant. And so she's like, Thea, if the line for the elderly and the pregnant isn't open, you come to my register. You skip everybody in line. (laughs) She's like, I don't want you waiting. Oh my gosh, that is so sweet. (laughs) And so this was the before. I had him and the Italians were just besides themselves. You know, like they were just besides themselves. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, he's so handsome. What's he doing today? I mean, they're just so nice. I I almost, I understand those women who have like multiple kids for the attention. (laughs) And you're like, you know, and I nailed it with one. (laughs) Mic drop. (laughs) Nailed it on my first try. (laughs) We'll be right back. Mother Teresa once said, There are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there are many more dying for a little love. Do you ever wish that you could increase your capacity to give and receive love? If so, I invite you to subscribe to my podcast, Filled with His Love, the podcast that draws on religion and psychology to help you strengthen your attachment relationships with family, with friends, and with God. I, I don't think it's because my son is awesome and fantastic, which he is, but just because they love kids. They really love kids here. There's another, like, let's call it open air cafe that we go to. And my son and I, besides the fact, like, I would go with my stroller with him during the day, like, I had a whole year off. I was working for an American company that had an extraordinary maternity package, right? But my son and I would go to the cafe, we'd go out to dinner, like, I mean, nobody looks at you strange because you have a kid, nobody's, like, giving you the side eye because the child has a moment, you know, like, there, there's another German lady, and, like, once he's like toddling around, he'd kind of toddle around and go say hi to other like kids and other parents. Maybe they'll play with your kid too. And they'll play with each other. And like, you keep an eye on them, but it's not like you have to be right there. I remember my American friend came and he's like, you're letting him walk that far. And I'm like, yeah, I can see him. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, of course. Wow. (laughs) So it's been fabulous even as like my little half black interracial baby that I was worried that they were going to be mean to they've been awesome they've been awesome 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 I can't say that's been everybody's experience I can only speak of mine I can and I didn't say this before because like I like to say like racism exists it it exists here too So for example, when I was giving birth, the lady asked me what was my like highest level of education. And my husband has a master's degree. And he was like, oh, I have a master's degree from this university. And she looked at me and she was like, what's your highest level of education? Like high school. And I wanted to be like, "Mm." they what now? (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to be like, sweetheart. I speak three languages fluently. I have a master's degree from the best business school in the country. Thank you very much. But you know, I'm in labor. (laughs) (laughs) But if I wasn't in labor, I would read you. (laughs) Oh my 
gosh. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. But I, I think that it's important to say too, because, you know, this is for many people that listen to this podcast, they are in America, not all, right? A lot of them also, or some of them come from different parts of the world, like yourself from Trinidad and Tobago originally. And it's really to just, you know, highlight and articulate that there is no utopia where you can go and escape all forms of racism. It's just that America has perfected it, (laughs) has reinforced it, Mm -hmm. has systems in place to preserve it. And so that is why many people, including yourself, have, you know, found that there are ways and places that that is one less layer to endure, right? You don't have to endure it. So I definitely want to, I'm glad that we discussed that as well. So you clearly love Italy so much so that you have created an entire business around it, doing Italy and helping people who are interested in moving abroad, interested in relocating to Italy. Tell me about that whole process. Tell me about your course and just give us a a snippet of, of what it's like. Wow. Wow. That course was a total pandemic pivot. I was working in travel before that um, with an American company in the United States, essentially half of the year. And then travel stopped and I was like, what am I going to do now? We were very blessed. And I have to say that's one of the other things that I learned when I moved to Italy is that Italians, generally speaking, have a whole different level of, let's say, tendencies towards savings. It's like you save your money, you save your money, you save your money. And my husband comes from that very old school, you know, parents bought their car cash kind of situation. So when the pandemic happened, we had enough money saved up that we were like, okay, Like we literally had plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. And plan D was like, the world ends and we can't pay our rent, but we can still eat for a year to two years. You know, (laughs) there was literally all of that. And so I was blessed that we didn't have that financial stress on us when the pandemic hit, even though my American company essentially put me on leave. I went on unemployment, but I was in a space where I could literally, I literally spent almost every afternoon meditating, right? In fact, I invested in a course because of the way things happened. My son wasn't here and Italy had a very strict lockdown, if you guys remember. And because I was in the United States when the pandemic hit and when they closed the daycares, but they hadn't closed the borders, my husband sent my son to his grandparents because he was still working. And then the next week they closed everything and we couldn't travel between regions. His family was in a different region. I was in the United States. In fact, I flew back in to Zurich, took a train back here, the strangest experience in the whole wide world. And I remember they got, I got to the airport in Zurich and they were like, are you sure you want to go there? And I was like, should I go back, (laughs) you know, back to the States? And I came here. My son was not with us, which was perfect because he was in a little village of 300 people on the beach with grandparents that absolutely adored him, which in what was to come was the best place for him to be. So I spent those first three months literally meditating and very much in what do I want to do with my life? What can I offer the world? Because the world was in such a crazy place. And I, even though I was in Milan, which was like the epicenter of the pandemic in the beginning, I felt really safe and really comfortable, right? And 
in that period, I thought once those first three months, four months ended, I literally just had a thought in my head was, I wonder if people want to move to Italy. And I literally just said, I wonder if I should create a course around this. And I went to work on it using like past experiences, past Um, I had purchased a course two years before, not knowing it was a course on creating courses. (laughs) But sometimes I feel guided by God to do things. And when I'm good, I listen. I don't always listen. I'm getting better at listening to when I think he speaks to me. So that was two years before. But at the point in time, I was writing a book on visiting Milan. I did a guidebook on the city. So I created this course. I released it to the world. I hadn't even created the course. I told people, hey, I'm thinking about doing a course. This is what I have in mind. These are the modules. I literally pulled all of my friends, everybody, and I and I put it out in the world, literally. And the feedback was phenomenal. Like phenomenal. My first group of students, I think I had 50 students in the very first batch. The reviews were like out of this world like they basically sold all the other courses I did after that because they were like Thea this is so good you should be charging so much more I already had like students move to Italy like six months after the first course came out right and so the whole course creation the pivot I think it was God working through me and me finally learning to listen (laughs) Yes, because (laughs) first it it happens in God Speaks to You First in Whispers, Mm -hmm. right? That was that first course that you were like, oh, it's a course about courses, right? And then it gets louder and gradually louder. And so it was awesome that you were able to listen and heed the message and create what is a beautiful course. You know, for full disclosure, I have taken the course. It is awesome. It is amazing. And it keeps getting better. And that's what I love about it. You have a a wonderful attention to detail. You care immensely about your students. And I see your Instagram feed. You're cheering them on. You're meeting with them when they come. I just, I love the energy that you bring and the enthusiasm. And that's why um, I'm just so happy that you were able to listen to that um, message and to really pivot and create this wonderful opportunity that impacts so many. We'll be right back. At this very moment, you are faced with a choice. Do I continue doing what I have been my entire life? Or do I tap the listen now button and take the red pill? Peter and I will be waiting for you on the other side. Yeah, and it, I'm in a space now where I'm like, okay, I want to change so many things with the course because I want to make it so much better. And I also think there's so many other things that God wants me to do in this world related to moving to Italy and other things as well, but almost always still related to Italy. <laughs> but it's a very interesting let's call it space mindset to be in, in terms of, you know, just kind of letting things work through you, trying and learning to let go of the stress. And you know how many times I stress out about stuff? I'm going to totally like go on on another little tangent here. Okay. Just bear with me. (laughs) I sprained my ankle about two months ago and doing it late got started when I sprained my ankle. I thought I sprained my ankle about five years ago. It actually turned out to be like, like three, like lacerated ligaments in my leg. It turned out to be like a whole ugly, ugly ordeal that I was out of work for like a year and a half, you know, like crying, you know, like, oh, no, 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 all that ugly. But doing Italy was born out of that because I was 
bored out of my mind at home. I had seen every single episode of like of how to get away with murder and scandal and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I need to find something to do with my time because like something. And when I hurt my ankle again, two months ago, the same ankle from five years ago, I was like, okay, Thea, like bring it back in. You're working too hard, right? What is God trying to tell you right now in this moment? Because he's obviously trying to tell you something and you've just been like running all these streets and not really running because, you know, running these streets in the sense of running up and down in my house. <laughs> but I was just working, 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 you know, serving my clients, loving up on them because I love it. But I wasn't taking that time to take care of me. And it was almost like, I'm going to force you to lay on your bed and sit down because this is the only way I can make you do this. Right? What I heard from that was that you were able to listen and be still, <sighs> right? Because the the pause, right? Because when I talked about it a second ago, God speaks to you first in whispers and then it gets louder and louder until it has to do something to shake you up right. and so maybe that sprain was the thing that shook you up but the interesting part when you made that comparison between the two times was that you were able to see it for what it was an opportunity to pause an opportunity to slow down an opportunity for self-care mm -hmm. and that you and I don't want to put words in your mouth but we're able to fill your cup back up exactly. so that it enabled you to pour more into the people that you love, the people that are in your family, the people that are your clients. And so many of us that, you know, I only see snippets of, of you know, your life, you know, virtually through Instagram and things like that. But, you know, I definitely feel the energy in the good vibe that you bring forth in everything you do. Yeah. All of that. <laughs> <laughs> All of that. I was in trauma response. My mind was going back to five years ago and all the bad things that had happened, even though I knew that with everything bad that happens in quotation marks, it's always just him guiding you someplace else. So I knew it, but I was like, I don't want to be in my bed anymore. I don't want to go through this anymore. What is it that you want me to? Because I'm trying to figure it out real quick, right? And I was in such a panicked place. I was like, Thea, you need to calm down. And I opened up my Bible. And I don't remember what verse it was right now, but I took a picture. And it was literally like Jesus, like taking the Jews, you know, away. And then, you know, them praying to him and he basically saying, I know you're in a difficult place right now, but remember all of the times that I have always been there for you and I will continue to be there for you, right? I just read it and I was like, oh. And like literally just all of the stress in my body like just went away and a whole bunch of the other stuff that I had been stressing about and like, oh, how, like literally like the next day, like they just resolved itself, resolved itself, resolved itself. And I was like, just need to remember that he is always there. And even when it's something difficult, right? Even when it's something difficult, there's always a reason why if you're willing to look and to see what it is, and it may not present itself to you in that moment. Like, I didn't know when I started doing Italy five years ago that it would become what it is now. I didn't think I was going to be able to start a course, you know, potentially like quit my day job because, you know, like so many other avenues and possibilities have been opened up to for me and to me because of it. And I think it was his way of saying, and I'll keep on doing it if you just like stay the course and you continue to listen. And, and yeah, 
that was my detour about my foot. <laughs> I love the detour. I love the pivot. And that is such a great way to end our conversation. So Thea, thank you so much for being a guest on the Blacks of Global podcast, for being so transparent about, you know, your birth story, your time in Milan, and all of the lovely things that you're doing, including doing Italy. So where can people find you? If you're looking to find me, you can find me at doingitaly.com. It's also Doing Italy on Instagram, Doing Italy on Facebook. I'm also starting my own personal, let's call it branding page, a little bit more of my life. That's not just Italy. (laughs) And that's on my name, which is I am Thea Duncan. And that's it. That is awesome. Thank you so much. So I will link all of that in the show notes for this episode. And again, thank you so much for being such a great guest. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy that I got to be here. Thank you for listening to the Blacksit Global Podcast. For more information on today's episode, be sure to visit our website at blacksitglobal.com. It's not only possible to live out your dreams unbothered and in full color, it is your birthright. Are you trying to sort out health plans, banking, VPN, and other connectivity for your move abroad? Well, have no fear. We've got you with the Move Abroad Starter Kit. Get yours today at blacksitglobal.com resources. That's blacksitglobal.com resources.